Hello, my name is Ian Smith. I'm the principal of Christ College, and we're here to welcome Cam Klausing to Christ College. Welcome, Cam. It's good to be here. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Now, it's interesting getting you here in COVID times. You landed at the airport. You were welcomed to Australia by the army, uh, marched off into quarantine. How was that? Well, a two-week quarantine in a two-bedroom hotel room with two children under the age of 10 is always a lot of fun. My children were literally climbing up walls. So from here on in, it's all downhill at Christ College from that? <laughs> Pretty, yeah, I mean, that was the height of my Sydney experience. Now, this is not your first time to Australia. No, my, uh, my bride, Taryn, is from Adelaide. We got married here in Australia. We spent a few days in Sydney after our, after our wedding, but we are happily acquainted with Australia. My wife more so than me, obviously. Absolutely. So, but this is still fresh coming into Sydney, coming to Christ College, and fresh eyes are, are good eyes in many ways. What have you noticed over the last couple of weeks since they let you out of quarantine? <laughs> yeah, um, it's been a, it's been kind of a whirlwind. We've, we've, I mean, Sydney, we've been struck by how Sydney is a world-class city. It's everywhere you go, there are people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. It's really a great city to raise your kids in. It's a great city to... Uh, explore. We've been uh, blown away by how beautiful the city is just here on the coast um, and how iconic so many things are from the Harbour Bridge to the Opera House and then and then the, the warmth of the people, especially the people in the uh, Presbyterian Church of Australia. That's great to hear. Now you've come a long way. You've come a long way to Christ College. To uh, When we were talking to you last you were in Georgia then Tennessee and you've just come from Scotland. We'll get to that later. Why come all this way? What compelled you to come to Christ College? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. My wife and I had had conversations after we finished up our time in Edinburgh, and we planned that the U.S. was going to be our, our final uh, landing spot. And in fact, we had said, you know, we could probably do one more international move, but if it was going to happen, it was the only place we would go is Australia, just to come home for Taryn. She hasn't been here in, in 15 years. And then... Uh, Kelly Capick, the one of the theologians at Covenant College, where I was working as a visiting lecturer for the year, sent this job description for a job at Christ College. I didn't really know much about Christ College at the time. Uh, Kelly said, you may be interested in this. I don't know. And he suggested that I apply for the job. So I applied for it, told Taryn, said, hey, I applied for this job in Australia. And uh, and we both said, we'll see what happens. We didn't expect to actually get here. Uh, we We kept saying... Um, well, if we don't have a job by the, by the end of May, uh, March, everything's gone horribly wrong. Yeah. And the job didn't close here until the uh, beginning of April. So we, I just kind of figured if you called, I'd say, ha, I'm not interested anymore. But the Lord called us here. We, uh, we got excited as we started having the conversations about um, Christ College, the, the fact that Christ College is a school that is intent on training ministers for the mm -hmm. Presbyterian Church of Australia. We, we got excited about the fact that it is founded and finds its foundation on Scripture, while at the same time holding its confessional standards high, the, the Westminster Confession of Faith. And, 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 and even while doing that, is interested in being engaged in the broader culture and asking the question, how do we bring the gospel to a culture that is, uh, in a lot of ways, completely and utterly devoid of any sort of uh, Christian influence. Mm. So um, all of those things together just helped me go, yeah, I think this is the right call. Like this is, this is what the Lord is calling us to at this moment. So we're, we were quite excited to get here. Well, we were praying on the other side as well. So it's great to hear that confirmation. Now, you married an Australian. So where did you meet? Well, we, I mean, we have that typical story of a uh, boy, American boy meets uh, Australian girl in Bogota, Colombia. Of course. And, and, you've, and tell us about your family. And, and that's been a journey in itself, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So Taryn and I met in Bogota, Colombia. And our first year of marriage, we spent back in, in Bogota. But from the very beginning of our marriage, even while we were dating, we had conversations about how we would see our family form. We, we always thought that um, the Lord would bless us with biological children. And then we would also adopt. Both of us have had adoption as a, as a big part of our lives. I, I myself am adopted by my father. And my parents then adopted two other children. But uh, as we progressed in our, in our marriage... 
we just we we realized that the Lord was not blessing us with children, but it, so we thought we'd start the adoption process anyway and just see what happens. And uh, the Lord blessed us with a little boy named Calvin Jack, who came into our lives. We we found out about him on a on a Monday and had and had him in our arms on a Thursday. Wow! It was it was a whirlwind. We weren't wow. expecting it. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then while we were in Edinburgh uh, doing my PhD. A few months before we left, our adoption agency called us and said, "Hey, we have another we have another little girl uh, who is eight, and we we would be interested in finding out if you guys would be interested in adopting her." So, on our way out of leaving Edinburgh, as I was finishing my PhD, I was uh, Taryn and I went to uh, Lesotho, a small country inside of South Africa, and we picked up our older daughter now. She's older than Calvin Jack. Calvin is five. Grace is ten now. We picked her up. And we brought her home to um, to Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, where I started working at Covenant College. Wow. So that's a lot of changes, isn't it? <laughs> that is. Um, so you've gone from Scotland to Lesotho. Grace has then gone to the States, yep. which is new for her. And then she's moved up to Tennessee, to Sydney. Well, we're glad you're putting down some roots. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> it's a few changes in, in a short period of time. <laughs> Now, the position you applied for, which you were successful in getting, which we're really pleased about, is a lecturer in applied theology and missional engagement. Yeah. What does that mean? That's a great question. I, 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 as, I, as, I, as I look at this job, I think that it's a, really a generalist position. It's, uh, I'm a theologian by training, um, and, and as, I, as I consider the job that, that's before me, it's really asking the question, how do we do both uh, theology, but then bring it into the culture around us. I, I think of theology oftentimes as um, as kind of those those core exercises that you need to know how to do, and and as you learn how to do those exercises correctly, then you can go out into the world and do things like picking up a box correctly. Um, so when I think about theology, it's learning to do those exercises and then applied theology and missional engagement is saying, okay, now let's take those, those exercises that you learned in the gym and learn how to do functional movements in the world around us. Okay. Okay. So theology dictates practice. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's awesome. So how, if that's the case, what's your measure of success going to be in the job? I mean, how do you know you've done a good job in that? Yeah, I, I mean that's a that's a great question. I mean, you could make the joke answer like lots of numbers, people, people, uh, people really uh, c uh, coming and saying like, oh, you've changed my lives. No, I mean, I really do think what what we, I mean, what I aim for is to be um, a, a mentor scholar in, in the sense that being able to mentor students and see students kind of get the fact that like theology isn't this dull and arid science. It's not something that's just boring but really causes them to learn how to do their ministry as they go out into the world uh, well. It teaches um, them to be evangelists, um, not just going out into a church to maintain whatever they, um, to maintain whatever they get as they go into that church, but to go out and go, okay, what is my role in seeing the kingdom of God grow in this area mm -hmm. that, we, that we are? Um, so I, I look at it as... Um, I look at, at success not necessarily in numbers, not necessarily in um, seeing uh, seeing students say, "Oh, you've changed my lives," but but being able to see the church grow uh, because students are able to go, "How can I be an evangelist in the world around me?" Okay. So you're an American. I am, very much so. You're married to an Australian, but I am. very much so. Very much so. <laughs> but you're an American. So. And you're going to be teaching missional engagement yeah. in Australia. Yeah. So there's pluses and minuses in that. There's challenges in that. But there's a lot of good stuff in that as well. Yeah. These th I'm sure you've thought about that. We've thought about that. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that the, there, are, there are some pretty big challenges. Uh, I think I am an American. Um, mm -hmm. That carries with it, for better or worse, a lot of baggage. Uh, people people see Americans and they go, that's an American. Mm -hmm. um, no comment. <laughs> I'm not wearing white tennis shoes, which is good. That's good. Um, but uh, but I, I am. I mean, I'm an American, so it means that I'm not Australian, and it means that I need to learn the Australian culture. Mm. It, it requires a lot of work in, in le learning how to listen 
uh, learning how to understand and ask good questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's, I mean, those are just areas where I think I, I, I'll need to grow. Um, I think I'll need to learn, learn the culture well to be able to uh, help teach that. But at the same time, I think one of the things that um, both my experience as uh, in studying theology, studying uh, Herman Bovink, the Dutch mm -hmm. reformer, and also in my experience as, uh, as a person who's traveled internationally quite a bit, living in Bogota, Colombia, living in Edinburgh, has taught me it's how to ask good questions, yeah. how to listen well, and then be able to um, think through, well, what are, what are the things that this culture is is yearning for what where is this culture looking for its enoughness um it's it's justification it's salvation and i think that um so i think that i think that being an outsider actually both is a challenge because i'm an outsider but it's also an opportunity because it allows me to see things that i don't think an australian will see absolutely absolutely and, and so you're an American married to an Australian who you met in Colombia who has a daughter born in Lesotho who's done a PhD in Scotland and ministered in the States. Mm -hmm. So my guess is that cultural engagement is really, you know, something happens every day in your, <laughs> in your existence. And, um, yeah, and that, those external eyes are going to be very, very helpful. Yeah. yeah. So which is one of the things we really value. Yeah. Now, you mentioned Bavink. Yeah. Not Herman Bavink. Yeah. You we say Bavink in America. Oh, do you? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Herman <laughs> Bavink. Okay. Who is this guy? Yeah. Um, well, see, he was, a, he was a late 19th, early 20th century Dutch theologian. Yep. He worked with the statesman theologian uh, and, and really just all around, like, Renaissance man, Abraham Kuyper mm -hmm. at the same time. Bavink was a... Uh, was a brilliant theologian. Many people have said that he is uh, the most important theologian after after Calvin. But a lot of a lot of people in the English speaking world haven't heard of him mm. until the twentieth twenty first century, really, because uh, his work w remained in Dutch, mm -hmm. though though mediated through theologians like Louis Burkhoff, who wrote really the the, the theolo uh, reformed theological text of the twentieth century. Yep. So um, he so he did this. He his big emphasis is on seeing how um, theology uh, can remain orthodox in a modern world, mm. and uh, and there's been a lot of work being done on on Bavink's attempt to remain orthodox while also being a modern man. So you've just submitted your PhD to the University of Edinburgh, yep. just waiting on the Viva. Yep. So we're just, we're in the final stages. Yep. And uh, so Bavink has really been your, your best friend for the last few years, I imagine. You've, yep. you've lived and breathed Bar Bavink. Would he be a good person for the lecture in applied theology and cultural and missional engagement? Yeah, I think he is. I mean, w once again, he's a, he's a man that um, early in his career is thinking very deeply about theology. I mean, he writes his magnum opus uh, at the end of his, the first half of his career. Uh, as he as he is working inside of a, a seminary, much like this mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. uh, he he writes the Reformed Dogmatics, and then he and then he moves to Amsterdam from a small town. He moves to the the, the city of Amsterdam, and um, his his focus really changes at that moment from being uh, just a systematician, or or per, perhaps better, a, a dogmatician, someone who studies the theology of the church, and then he he moves to being. Uh, someone who's thinking about how does this apply to the world around me? How does how does how does this apply really to politics, to pedagogy? How does it apply to science? And and he write and and you really see this change throughout the the second half of his career, where he gets more engaged in in um, in politics. He gets engaged in science and uh, teaching. Um, so uh, what we see is is him saying, okay, how do I apply my theology? In fact, his nephew, whom he taught, uh, goes on and becomes one of the leading missionaries in uh, in Indonesia, mm -hmm. um, J. H. Bavink, and really applies his uh, applies Herman's thoughts to uh, missiology and how to do missions. Okay, okay, great. Now I was talking to you in the corridor the other day, and you just just a throwaway line you said, you said I'm a reformed Presbyterian. Okay, 
Um, what did you mean by that? And, and why is that? Why is that how you, or is that how you self-identify? Yeah, I mean, I would probably, I would probably throw in the word confessionally reformed Presbyterian. Oh, okay, that's <laughs> even stronger. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would self-identify as a confessionally reformed Presbyterian in saying that, that I, I take my theological cues from, from our confession, the Westminster Confession of Faith. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't, I don't stand on Scripture. I, I believe that you can't do theology without Scripture. But when it comes to the tradition that I find myself in, I find myself in a, uh, a Reformed Presbyterian tradition. A and my starting point when I start thinking theologically is about, uh, comes from the Westminster Confession of Faith. So why is being confessional important? Yeah, I mean, if, if we aren't confessional, if we don't have some sort of confession that we hold, hold on to and hold high, we end up finding ourselves anchorless. Mm -hmm. um, as we go into uh, reading scripture, we, we need some sort of theology that, hold, that, that, we, um, that we come to scripture with. Otherwise, we end up flying through all of the uh, heresies that the early church had to deal with. In fact, we see this throughout history. Whenever somebody comes to Scripture saying, no creed but the Bible, mm -hmm. which is already a creed, uh, they, they, end up, they end up going through every one of the heresies that the early church had to deal with. Mm -hmm. So we need to know how to uh, do, read the Bible theologically. And, and my theological starting point is the confession. Great. That's awesome. Now, just as we wrap up, when you arrived here at college, one of the first things you did, we, we took, showed you where your office is, and you've dismantled it. We're actually sitting in your office at the moment. I, I walked up here one day and your desk was dismantled, and these lounge chairs are here. It looks more like a lounge room. I mean, <laughs> is it going to continue this way? What, 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 what's happening? Yeah, the, I mean, the, the first thing I said when I walked into my office was, I want to make room for a couple chairs. It was primarily just so we could have conversations like this with students. I, I value the role, as, I, as I've already said, I value the role of being a mentor scholar. And I, I think mentor comes first on purpose because I think that in, a, in an institution like this, our job is first and foremost to come alongside students. Mm -hmm. It's secondarily to be scholars. I think we need to be scholars still. But but I need to come, I want to be able to come along students and I want to make my office as inviting a place for students to be able to come in and sit, have a cuppa and uh, and enjoy and enjoy talking through whatever uh, we talked about in class or something that's happening in their ministry. Uh, I want to be able to be to make this as, as inviting and as uncomfortable a place for them as possible. Well, this has been I mean, I feel like chatting forever. I'm very comfortable here. It's been great chatting, and I'm sure others have enjoyed chatting with us in your office. So welcome to Australia. Thank you. And thanks for welcoming us, welcoming us into, I don't know what to call it, your office, your lounge room, <laughs> getting to know you. And we're really looking forward to Taryn and the kids just really settling into life in Australia and what you have to offer here at Christ College. So thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you.